Uh, we've been talking about meditation on Bible subjects. This past week, we looked at the gospel, and that's where we're going to start again this week. We'll start with the homework that I assigned to you as we were exploring the idea of what the word gospel means and what's uh, entailed in the gospel. Uh, I, I gave you an assignment last night or last week to, to say that the word gospel often appears in a prepositional phrase, and I suggest that we can learn a bit about the gospel by tracing these phrases throughout the New Testament. And so I ask you to do some uh, some Bible searching for uh, phrases such as gospel of and the gospel to and so on like that. And I ask you to make a list of the verses that you find and see if it deepens your understanding of the nature and the origins of the gospel. Hope everybody did that. I'm going to show you some of the ones that I found as I did this subject myself. Uh, and then if you have some others that, that I don't mention that you want to bring to us, to our attention, we just go ahead and put that in the chat and we'd be glad to see what you found as well. Uh, the gospel of the kingdom is one of the primary things that you'll find. Uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, and there's a bunch of other passages that will mention the gospel of the kingdom. This is the gospel that makes people a part of the kingdom of God, that brings us into that kingdom and, and has us enrolled in the kingdom. So it becomes the gospel of the kingdom because it proceeds from the kingdom of God and it brings us into the kingdom of God. We become children of God through that gospel message. It's also the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, that's Mark chapter 1, verse 1, and following uh, other, other passages as well. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 1, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel that came from Christ himself. It was spoken by his lips first. Uh, it was in, uh, it encapsulates all that it was that, that Jesus became and, and was for us. Uh, so this gospel that belongs to Jesus, it's the gospel that, that uh, proceeded from Jesus Christ himself. It's the gospel that speaks of Christ. It's also the gospel of God, and that's Mark chapter 1, verse 14, and other passages like it, uh, the gospel of God. It's the gospel that God conceived from the beginnings of the time before, before the world was even laid. Where the foundations of the world were even established. God had already planned a plan to save us from our sins because he knew when he created us and gave us the free will that we would that we choose to use that free will against God. So he planned that, uh, that uh, salvation to come through the gospel because of the gospel of God. It's also the gospel of the grace of God. It's the gospel that tells us about God's grace and the fact that he has mercy for everyone, that he is willing to save us in spite of ourselves. Acts chapter 20, verse 24 is one of the passages that you can look at to speak of the gospel of the grace of God. It's the gospel of the glory of Christ, a uh, wonderful, wonderful phrase there. The gospel of the glory of Christ. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4 uses that phrase, at least in the New American Standard Version. Uh, so the glory of Christ is discussed in the gospel message, uh, the fact that he is glorious beyond all glory, that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and so on. It speaks of his great and his, his majestic existence. It's the gospel of your salvation. That's what Paul calls it to the church at Ephesus in chapter 1 and verse 13 of Ephesians. Uh, the gospel of your salvation, it brings about the idea, the understanding, the comprehension of how a person is saved. So it becomes the gospel that saves us. Now, yes, Christ is our Savior. God is our Savior. The gospel is the means by which they bring about that salvation. It's the gospel of peace. You can, you can search all of the, all of the primary codes and, and uh, uh, ideas that people have put forth, philosophies for living and living a great life, but the gospel will be greater than all of them when it comes to the gospel of peace. It teaches us to be peacemakers and not just peace lovers. It teaches us to reach beyond ourselves into the lives of other folks, to be empathetic to other folks. It teaches us to promote peace in our lives. So it's the gospel of peace. Again, that's Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 15. It is the gospel to the uncircumcised. I appreciate so much our Brother Donald's lesson tonight. As we see uh, people lumped together according to their, to their uh, primary characteristics, according to some person's idea, uh, all of the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, were the folks that uh, were looked down upon by the Jews. But God planned a plan to bring the gospel to them as well. So it's the gospel to the uncircumcised, all the Gentiles, to all those folks who didn't look like the Jews or act like the Jews or behave like the Jews. Uh, God wanted to save everyone on the earth according to that plan, so he made a gospel to the uncircumcised. Uh, it's the good news of great joy. This is another passage. I, I started looking at the word good news instead of gospel because it's the same thing. So it's the good news of great joy. Uh, Luke chapter 2 and verse 10. So the angel brings the, uh, the message to the, uh, to the shepherds and so on. That's the good news of great joy. Uh, so we have the, uh, the idea of how wonderful and how wondrous the gospel message is, how great the news is the gospel brings that we can have salvation from our sins. It's the good news of the promise. Uh, what promise is that? The promise of eternal life with God. That's Acts chapter 13, verse 32. The good news of the promise is the good news of good things to come. Uh, look at Romans chapter 10, verse 15 for that. Uh, so all of these all of these passages, and there's many more. I didn't even go to the gospel too for my own work here. And maybe you folks did. But anyway, the idea is that the gospel is a great and a magnificent uh, uh, document. It is a it's a, a plan that God planned for the for the salvation of mankind from the beginning of the world. It's a wonderful thing that brings us into the kingdom of God. 
So if you had those ideas, I, I appreciate it. Um, let's go back now to the idea of the gospel and let's look at some more in information concerning the gospel. Let's start with the last lesson. The last lesson we discussed the meaning of the word gospel, that it means the good news, that it means that, that message that was spoken to the world to bring salvation to all mankind. We discussed the five instances of the Great Commission in each of the gospels in the book of Acts. We saw that, that five different times in the, in the Bible, uh, we are told to take that gospel to all the world and preach the gospel to all, the, all of mankind, uh, all, of, all of the living creatures on the earth, uh, as far as uh, uh, people are concerned. Uh, we discussed the power of the gospel to save, that only through the gospel can we be saved. We discussed the singular nature of the gospel, that there's only one gospel, and how we must be aware of false gospels, and anything that would lead us away from God by being a false gospel. And then finally, we observed that the gospel must be obeyed. Uh, now tonight we're going to pick up sort of there. We're going to look at the idea that the gospel has things that have to be obeyed and we have to follow those things to be saved. So we'll talk about that as we continue on. This is going to be the gospel part two. We're actually going to have, in this particular case, we're going to have a gospel part three. We're not going to finish everything tonight on the gospel because it's such a complex matter and I want to make sure that we don't rush too much. So we're going to look at the gospel part two tonight. Tonight we're going to meditate on the nature of the gospel. Remember this is a uh, these are meditations on Bible subjects, so we're going to meditate on the nature of the gospel, that it consists of three basic things, really. It consists of facts to believe, commands to obey, and promises to accept and receive. And we're going to cover the first two of those in tonight's lesson. We're going to look at the, the gospel consisting of facts to believe and commands to obey, and then we'll continue next week with promises to accept and receive. The gospel is facts to believe. Let's talk about that for just a moment. Christ died for our sins and was foretold, as was foretold in the Old Testament scriptures. It's one of the things that we have to believe about the gospel is that Christ died for our sins, that he was foretold in the Old Testament scriptures, that we were looking forward to him coming. When he came, he was accepted as, as uh, who he was by those who knew him best and those who received him as the light of the world. Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 3, if we, as we discuss this uh, idea that the gospel has to do with facts to believe. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 3, Paul says at the church of Corinth, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, and which also you stand, but which also you were saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ Jesus died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Folks, the whole idea that Christ died for our sins is the fact that we have to believe about Jesus Christ coming. That he came to the world so that he could die for our sins and so that we could have the forgiveness that we needed. That can only take place through Christ. If you don't believe that Jesus came to, to die for your sins, if you believe that, as so many folks do, that he was just a good teacher or a good man or a righteous man or whatever, a God-loving, God-fearing man, then you've totally missed the idea of the gospel. Uh, there are lots of good people in this world, but none of them can save you from your sins. But Jesus came so he died for our sins. We had the chance for salvation through his name. So the gospel is facts to believe. The gospel is also facts to believe. Uh, the same thought in Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6 where we see the Old Covenant uh, prediction or, or prophecy of the coming of Christ Jesus. It says, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we himself esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, was crushed for our iniquities, the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. Uh, Christ came to die so that we could live. He came to be scourged so that we could have freedom. He came to, to be chastened for our well-being to be uh, what it should be. He was crushed for our iniquities. He was killed for, for our sins to be paid for. All of those things happened because God pre-planned pre it. And so the gospel is facts to believe. We have to believe that Jesus came to, to die for our sins. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and 4, another thought of the same thing. Do you not know that all of you who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. We walk in newness of life only because we participate in the death of Jesus on the cross. As we go into the waters of baptism, we're participating, we're obeying the gospel by, by obeying the facts of the gospel. The facts of the gospel is that Jesus came to the earth, that he lived as a man, that he was, he was killed and he died, he was buried, he was raised up again. And as, we, as we're baptized in the, in the watery grave of baptism, we participate in the same thing. We die to ourselves as we're put down in the water, we're buried as we're put down in the water, we're raised up out of the water to walk in newness of life. We become a new creature, resurrected from the dead, as Christ was. And so we obey the facts of the gospel by our obedience in, in baptism. So Christ died, so we have to understand that. Uh, let's talk for just a moment about death, burial, and resurrection facts. Uh, the, the, the gospel has to do with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. I look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4 through 8. 
where, where Paul says there to the church of Corinth, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received and which also you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, the, the vain believing would be the person who believes but doesn't really believe and falls away. Uh, the, the proper believing is the person who believes to the extent that he changes his life forever. As Paul says, I make known to you the gospel that which I preached to you beforehand. You received it, you stand in it, and it is the word, uh, the word that you received that was preached to them as well. So if you hold fast the word, if you hold fast the facts given, to, given by Paul, the doctrine that was established by Paul uh, as he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, then, then we will not be believing in vain. So look at verse 3. I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. Christ died for our sins. There's the death. Uh, according to the scriptures, he was buried. There's the burial. And he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And the idea of the most important thing, the first importance of, of all, is this is the ABCs of, of salvation by Paul. The ABCs of salvation include the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. That's the core gospel that we have to believe. We have to believe facts about the gospel in order for us to be saved by the gospel. Second thing that I want us to see tonight that, that we need to believe as a fact is that Jesus is our Lord and our Savior. He is our Lord. He and only He is our Lord and our Savior. Uh, let's look at Acts chapter 2, verse 33 and 30, 33 through 36, as we discuss this, um, where, where Peter is preaching on that first gospel sermon, a series of messages from the Old Covenant that deal with why we understand and believe that Jesus is the coming Messiah, who's the one expected from before the beginning of time. Uh, look at look what he starts in verse 33. He says, Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured, out this, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. And he's speaking, of course, uh, of the appearance of the Holy Spirit and the uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit that took place only on the day of Pentecost. And then the second time that the baptism of the Holy Spirit took place was in the, in the uh, bringing of Cornelius into the fold, uh, so, that, so that both the Jews were baptized by the Holy Spirit and the Gentiles were baptized by the Holy Spirit. It's the only thing that we ever will discuss in the, in the Lord's Church about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. From that point on, we're going to talk about water baptism because water baptism is what we participate in, not Holy Spirit baptism. All right. So he poured forth this, which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So David is not the one who ascended into heaven, but David, foreseeing the Christ, said, but The Lord said to my Lord, The Lord God said to my Lord Jesus Christ, Sit at my right hand. So I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. All right, this, this Lord and Jesus, this Lord and Christ, uh, this Lord and Christ named Jesus is the one who's both our Lord and our Savior and our Christ, therefore. He was crucified by the people. And that's why they have to then say in the next verse, uh, men and brethren, what shall we do? What, what can we do to, to make this vast uh, problem that we created for ourselves by killing the Son of God? What can we do to make that right? And of course, we're told to be baptized in, in the name of the Father, or in the name of Christ Jesus, for the forgiveness of the sins, all right? So, the next fact that I want us to look at tonight that concerns facts that we have to believe is that Jesus is going to come back again. His imminent return is going to be, is planned for the future. We know that it's going to happen, we just don't know exactly when. But if you wait around and you decide that Jesus isn't coming, then you'll lose your gospel, you'll lose the facts of the gospel, you'll therefore lose your salvation eventually. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. After he said these things, he was lifted up, and this is Jesus being discussed. After he said these things, he was lifted up while they were looking on, as the apostles were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And as they were gazing intently into the sky, while he was going, behold, two men in white clothing stood beside them. Now, folks, you can argue all you want to all day, but those two men in white clothing were angels from heaven, came to speak to the people of this earth. Uh, and they said to the, to the men who were standing there, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into the sky? This Jesus who has been taken from you, up, to, up from you into heaven, will come in just the same way as you have watched him go into heaven. So there's going to come a time when Christ is going to return. He's going to return in the clouds of the sky. He's going to return on a day that nobody expects him, which can be just about any day. He, he comes when, when no one is really paying attention, I think. Uh, but he comes hoping to find somebody still faithful on the earth when he returns. I'm hoping that we will be those people, that we will continue to be faithful to him, because we will continue to believe the facts of the gospel. Uh, including the fact that Jesus is coming again someday, and we just don't know when. Acts chapter 17, verse 30 and 31, same thought. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that everyone, all people everywhere, should repent, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. So as Christ was raised from the dead as the proof, proof was that Christ is coming again. It's going to be a day of judgment that's coming. God is going to judge the world on that day. He has fixed the day in which it's going to happen. 
Only God knows when that day is. Even Christ didn't know when he was on this earth. Uh, but God knows when that day is going to come, and he will send Christ when the time comes and when the time's right. The expectation of the return of Jesus to receive the faithful home is paramount to our comprehension of the gospel. If you don't expect that Jesus is going to return, if you don't expect that he's going to take us to be with him, then the gospel is empty for you and empty for me. But folks, we understand that Christ is coming again, so we're waiting faithfully for that day, and we're remaining faithful to Christ until that day, hoping to be included in the kingdom of God for all eternity. Not only is the gospel facts to understand and facts to hold on to, it's also commandments to obey, commands to obey. So in addition to being facts to believe, the Christian must also be obedient to the gospel message. That has many ramifications for the faithful Christian because if we do not believe and obey the gospel, we will be lost eternally. Uh, the command to believe is vital to our obedience to the gospel. If we're not going to believe and if we're not going to obey, uh, then we will, not be, we will not be included in that heavenly call. So what kinds of things do we obey? Well, let's start with Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16, where Jesus says to them on that day, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Now, yes, the preaching of the gospel is one of the things we're going to be commanded to do, but that's not really what I'm looking at at this point in time. Verse 16 is what I want to look at. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. He who is not, he who is disbelieved shall be condemned. So we have to believe and obey. Uh, the belief is one thing. If you believe that Christ is Jesus is Lord, but you're not baptized into his, into his possession, you've only been part of the gospel. Uh, you can't get into Christ any other way than to be baptized into his name. So if you have believed and have been baptized, if you believe and then obey the baptismal call, then you'll be saved. But if you disbelieve, you'll be condemned. The person believing and being baptized is the one who will be saved. Belief without action is insufficient for salvation. So we need both of those things for us to be saved. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 15 and 16. Paul says, So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to those who are also in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul is clear that the gospel comes with power. That power is limited only to those who are, who are going to be believers. A belief is imperative to salvation, but also obedience to that belief is imperative as well. Power comes to the person who's going to be obedient through the gospel message to that gospel message itself. We must confess Jesus to be saved. This is the third of the, of the uh, things that we have to do to obey in order for us to be saved. We must confess Jesus to be saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, and then uh, we'll look at, in, in a minute at how this starts to stack up together. We'll look at Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, folks, this is not the only message that's preached by Paul, even in the gospel, in the book of Romans. This is not the, the end all and be all of everything you have to do to be saved. Paul is making a statement concerning confession and belief, but he does not disclude or uh, uh, he does not uh, uh, fail to include uh, or, or, or leave out the idea of baptism because he doesn't say that at this point in time. He's already talked about baptism in great detail in chapter 3. Again, chapter 6, in even greater detail in chapter 6, he's talked about baptism as being necessary for salvation. So if he doesn't repeat baptism here, it doesn't mean it's not important. It doesn't mean that it's not included. It just means that he didn't include it in this particular statement. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And the only way you're going to be saved is through obedience to those things. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, there's your, there's your activity there. Your result in righteousness. If we're going to be obedient to the to the uh, to the faith, we're going to obey the faith. We're going to do what Christ tells us to do. Uh, we will result in righteousness, being the the attitude of our life and the things that we're doing in our life will be righteous. And with our mouth, then we'll confess, resulting in salvation. All right. So hearing and believing should result in confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior. Failure to do so is failure to be obedient, and therefore failure to be saved. We can't be saved if we're not going to pro profess Christ as Lord and Savior in the first place. We have to be willing to speak up on behalf of our Savior and speak his, his name into the world and preach the gospel message to, to those who are lost. Next thing that we have to do by way of activity that, that we have to do by way of obedience is we have to repent of our sins. Knowing the gospel but not repenting is going to be empty as well. In Luke chapter 24, verses 46 and 47. And Jesus said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day. And there's the part of the gospel. That's the facts to believe. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Now, this is part of that statement of Paul of Luke's uh, statement concerning the Great Commission. That, that it's important for us to realize that we are going to repent of our sins, and, and repentance from sins is going to be proclaimed in the name of Jesus Christ uh, to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. So we all have the opportunity to, to be resurrected from our sins, and, and uh, resurrected from the dead, I mean, with our sins paid for, 
but only if we are willing to obey by repenting of our sins. Repenting is more than just saying, I'm sorry. It means changing your lifestyle so that you stop sinning and, and do good and righteous things. So we need to repent of our sins and return to Christ Jesus and do what he asks us to do. If we ever hope, have hope to be saved. Acts chapter 2, verse 36 to 37 will be another statement concerning our repentance. Verse 36, we were there just a moment ago. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, as Jesus whom you crucified. God made him both Lord and Christ. That's one of the facts of the gospel. Uh, now look at verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent. The very first thing that you have to do to, to be saved is to repent. After you hear and you believe, then you must repent. And each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we are to be obedient to Christ in repenting so that we can then have the opportunity to spend eternity with God as we repent of our sins and we live to be like Christ. And then we have the opportunity to, to participate in the, in the gospel with Jesus himself. So we have forgiveness of our sins and we will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the gift which is the Holy Spirit to dwell inside us for all eternity until we go back to be with God. In Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, Therefore repent and return so that your sins will be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. So we're also to repent so that we can have those times of refreshing, so that our, our souls can be saved by Christ, so that we can do what Jesus says when he says, come to me all you who are weak and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And we receive that soul rest only as we repent of our sins and return to Christ so that our sins can be wiped away. Acts chapter 17, verse 30, Finally, therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. So repentance is one of those things that we have to do by way of obedience to the gospel. Uh, to the facts of the gospel, we have to repent of our sins as a part of participating in that gospel. And finally, folks, for tonight, we must be baptized for the remission of our sins. Now, again, returning to Mark chapter 16, verse 16, he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. He who has disbelieved shall be condemned. I know some folks have tried to make an issue that, that baptism is not essential because he doesn't say he was disbelieved and has not been baptized. Folks, if you disbelieved, you're not going to be baptized anyway. That's just a fact, all right? The only way you're going to be baptized is if you believed, and then you're going to be baptized because you believe the, the message of the gospel. So he who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. Those two are both important or you will not be saved. Look at Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Now, why do you delay? This is, uh, this is Paul uh, reciting what happened when Ananias came to him. Ananias said, and why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So the, the washing away of the sins takes place at the point of baptism, not before. Uh, Paul had had an amazing uh, spiritual journey from the time that he was blinded on the road to Damascus. And three days of receiving immense visions from Christ that left him physically impaired for, forever. And, and yet, uh, when, when, when uh, Ananias comes, he says, you have to be uh, baptized and have your sins washed away that period of time. And not washed away by the waters of baptism, but washed by the, by the blood of Christ, uh, taken care of by the blood of Jesus in the waters of baptism as he was baptized. Then Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 to 27. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. See, you're not in Christ until you're baptized into Christ. You're not clothed with Christ until you're baptized into Christ. No amount of praying for Christ to come into your heart is going to result in Christ coming into your heart if you haven't obeyed what he told you to do. One of the things he said for you to do is to be baptized and, and then call on his name. So you are sons of God if you have faith in Christ Jesus. But all of you who are baptized into Christ are clothed yourselves with Jesus, not before. So we don't become children of God until we're baptized into his name. So our conclusion tonight, the gospel is a series of facts about Jesus of Nazareth, the eternal Son of God, which must be believed. It's also a series of commandments which must be obeyed in order for salvation to be granted. Next week, we're going to look at the gospel and make certain promises which we need to understand for our salvation to be ensured to us and for us to have the blessed assurance that Jesus saves. So the, I, I'm really especially looking forward to next week because I don't think we spend enough time speaking about the, the promises that we have through the gospel. Because I think if we did, we'd be so assured, so, so full of assurance that we couldn't help but, but speak out in the name of Christ Jesus. So I hope you'll be back with us this next week as we have an opportunity to discuss the gospel from the standpoint of the, uh, of the promises that it makes to us and that we can believe in if we have faith in Christ Jesus. Now let's go ahead and talk about our homework for tonight. Uh, uh, use it in a Bible search program or concordance. I'd like you to do that again this week, but this time make a list of support verses for each of the following requirements of the gospel. And I ask you to please use verses not already included in this lesson. Now, I only scratch the surface in this lesson of, of verses that talk about the, uh, the hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, repenting of sins, confessing the name of Jesus, being baptized in water baptism. So I'd like you to make a list of those things, all the things you can find, if you will, 
make it as complete a list as you possibly can because it will serve you really well in the future when you're trying to teach someone else how to obey the gospel. If you understand how hearing the gospel is important that it is, you understand that believing the gospel is very important and, and speak of how that's done. If you can talk about repenting of sins and have several verses to discuss repentance, you talk about confessing the name of Jesus and you have a couple of verses or so to talk about confessing Jesus, then especially if you have some, some idea of why water baptism is necessary, you can teach anybody the gospel message so they can believe anybody. Uh, so I, I pray that you'll do this uh, homework assignment. If you've not done any of the rest of them, please do this one. It'll serve you well in the future as you continue to try to do what Christ told you to do. That's to go into all the world and make, gospel, uh, make disciples of all the nations. As you preach the gospel to them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for the forgiveness of their sins. That's our lesson for tonight. I thank you for your time. And I will now turn it back over to Lynn for a closing song, and then we'll go to a closing prayer. Just a second.